Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then planning for your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. One strategy, of course, for accelerating the value of your business is to grow through acquisition. And we've discussed this strategy in, in past episodes with m and advisors, Matt Kraft and Lori, and Lori Barkman. Uh, today, we're going to revisit the topic with our guest who has actually made a few multi-million dollar acquisitions to scale its core business to over 35 million in revenue. And so um, we want to discuss with him what he's learned from his experience and also his thoughts, too, about a successful exit. I know he has some specific ideas and thoughts about what an owner should do after they exit. So we'll get into that, too. Our topic today, then, is build uh, business acquisitions and a successful exit. And we have with us Oren Klopper from South Africa, CEO and co-founder of NetSureit. Uh, excuse me, Oren co-founded NetSure 24 years ago during the lead up to Y2K, an exciting time. And, and at the time, organizations were being ripped off by IT companies and paying a fortune for technology they didn't need. And so Oren and his partners recognized an opportunity to provide managed outsourced services for companies and differentiate themselves with, listen to this, by being honest, ethical, and fair. How about that? He's always looking for innovative new ways to work. His people-focused leadership leads his team's aspirational culture and their dream program. He's a passionate Microsoft partner and committed to serve both employees and clients by nurturing and realizing their dreams. In addition to his role leading NetSure, he's active in the Young Presidents Association and the Entrepreneurs Organization, and he's earned a master's in entrepreneurship from MIT Sloan School of Management. Oren, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining us here today from South Africa. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Walter. Hey, Oren, great to have you. So Thank can you, you just maybe fill out the history of your company a little bit? I know Pat kind of gave us some highlights, you know, kind of how it started, a little bit on the acquisitions you've made and where it is right now. Yeah, sure. Uh, the business started at university with some friends. Um, I was studying information systems as one of my extra majors, and uh, it became my primary major. So that's really where it started. And then uh, in 1997, I decided this is, this is what I want to do. I kind of remember being at school and realizing with certain teachers I did really well where I respected them and, 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 and felt uh, inspired by them. And where I didn't respect or connect with them, I was a real problem child. Um, so I started to get some early thoughts that I, I probably need to try and control this dynamic as much as I can. Um, and then we, we, start, we signed our first annuity monthly managed services customer, I think it was 1999. Um, and, uh, we've just, we've just grown since then. We we've definitely evolved and differentiated, uh, but essentially we're serving entrepreneurial SMB customers. Our sort of customer profile is sort of 25 to a thousand user environments. And, um, we, we've, you know, we're still doing that to the day where we're today, where we're looking after their IT um and yeah we've grown both organically and acquisitively walter um and we did uh, over the last 24 months we did three acquisitions and um we've made lots and lots of mistakes along the way and there's nothing like a real crisis or a real mistake to create deep institutional institutional learning so today uh, we're just short of 40 million dollars in revenue um, we're just over 300 people across South Africa and New York. Our presence uh, in the U.S. is across New Jersey and New York primarily. Um, and uh, blessed to absolutely still love love what I do to this day. 
Fantastic. So let me ask you a question. Have any of your acquisitions ever turned out not as well as you would hope they would? Oh, for sure. Um, we... What do you see as kind of, if looking back on it now, is there some, is there something you could have done differently or what do you, what did, what did you learn from that? Well, I think the one particular acquisition we did, we, um, you know, so, so let, me, let me step back and then I'll get to what we got wrong there. I think when we are acquiring a business, what we have learned and what we are trying to apply to all opportunities that we're working on currently and going forward is there is a magic in that business. There is, and it's hard to quantify, it's hard to measure. There is a magic that has come out of those founding members and we need to do everything we can to protect that magic whilst still realizing the value of the economies of scale and them joining us on this journey. So the one particular opportunity, I think we just went in, we were too dictatorial. We were like, this is what you got to do. This is our system. This is our process. Uh, this is a critical part of our culture. It's non-negotiable. And, and, and we just, I think we just forced ourselves into what was quite a quite a strong culture, and it really, really had uh, a negative impact. Um, and now, what our approach is, and where it's evolved to, Walter, is that uh, we we centralize marketing, uh, particularly lead generation. We centralize finance straight away on close, but we take quite an organic approach over time that is value based what we might choose to centralize and, and, and operationalize across the whole, the whole business. That's brilliant. Yes. That's so, really, that's really good because to, mm -hmm. to steal your word magic, you're, you're kind of trying to streamline things, take advantage of the economies of scale, but not kill the magic. Yes. Yeah. You don't and, want to quench the magic. You want to, yeah. you, you, want to find a way to probably even increase and scale the magic. That's it. Amplify it. So, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, parts of our acquisitive growth approach is we want the leaders. So maybe they are three key leaders and one wants to leave. Uh, that's, that's fine. But if all the key leaders want to leave, that's not a deal for us. So um, we want to keep those leaders and part of keeping those leaders is and appreciating that they were very autonomous. And how can we take that, mm. uh, that leader and the magic that they created and bring them into the organization to number one, protect the people as far as holding on to the key people. And out of that, it will protect the customer relationships. But, you know, what we've seen with the fast growth we've experienced, and if even if you look at Jim Collins's books, uh, the single greatest constraint to growth is great people and great leaders. And any person that joins our business through an acquisition that has a growth mindset and is a real performer will have more opportunity than they'll have uh, hours in the day. Mm-hmm. Okay. So does that mean when they, let's just say I'm the owner of a company that you acquire, you know, we always joke, we always joke, but it's true that the clients we work with who are business owners are going to be the worst employee anyone could ever have. So, you know, oftentimes what you're describing doesn't, doesn't work. So how do you get around that? Is it through use of incentives or is it letting kind of being a hands-off, letting them continue to do what they do or how do you how do you kind of look at that piece of it? Or yeah, so is it or, or or and is it like this? Is it we're not going to look at them as an employee so much? You're gonna you're gonna focus on that, making sure they still feel uh, like they have the autonomy autonomy they've always enjoyed, but then too maybe that they're seen as an entrepreneur versus a, an employee. Yeah, I think it's um, that that touches on a key piece of the the aspiration. So, what 
Well, let me talk to an example. So we, we bought a business in New Jersey in 2021. And we, we, we didn't do, we virtually did nothing except centralized finance and marketing. They significantly exceeded their numbers. We introduced a new product uh, called our Innovate Service, which is basically a ROI guarantee technology service where leveraging automation and um, uh, uh, use a, a technology adoption and digital transformation, we will find ROI that equates to the total amount you pay us in a year. They, that part of the business outsold the launch of that new product uh, out of every single office we have in the business. So we, we did nothing. They just embraced it. And if I were to say what made that so successful, we just got the culture fit right. Uh, and, and, you know, we, you try and assess that, and it's a difficult thing to assess. But um, looking back now, we really were successful with that. And what's transpired is we, we left them to run their operations. So I think it protected that autonomy uh, for them. Um, they, they have a growth mindset, so they've just embraced the idea of there is going to be change. How can I grow with, uh, this, this organization instead of trying to keep my own fiefdom and sort of, uh, not allow for any, for any change. Um, we're very participative and in, in our management and leadership styles, we have an exco meeting every single week and, uh, these guys are involved. Um, and we really try uh, our utmost not to micromanage anything or to break the magic or, 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 try, and, or try and enforce things on the culture that's, that magic will, will dissolve. Mm -hmm. yeah, so Maybe to talk back to your, to your question, the one other piece that we do do mm -hmm. is um, in some acquisitions and kind of going forward now it's part of our our model is we're looking for entrepreneurs that want to stay the course with us and we offer them anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of their equity can be rolled okay yeah so that was going to be a, a follow-up yeah, question definitely. as to how you're actually structuring the deals to to incent the the future growth and that the drive continues and so on and so forth. And two, when when you're making an acquisition, one of the things you, in the work that we do, and we're helping we're helping owners prepare for whatever exit is going to make sense for them. As you know, we're agnostic. Um, sometimes clients end up selling to a third party. Sometimes they do insider transactions. We're ESOPs, whatever. We're agnostic, but. In all of them, key employees are key, <laughs> no matter which route you choose. Yeah. And when it comes to when it comes to the third party transaction, we're always talking to them about, okay, well, if I'm going to buy your business, I'm I want to know that these key employees are going to stick around. So what have you done to ensure that's going to happen? When you're acquiring a business and you're doing your due diligence. How how do you assess that piece, and what are you looking for in regard to those key employees, and 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 how they're going to be kept around? Yeah, so I think at the heart of of why people stay within a company is probably best covered in Marcus Buckingham's book, First Break All the Rules, where oh, Gallup uh -huh. Gallup surveyed about a million people in about eighty thousand companies. And that survey has just continued to be done. I don't know what the latest numbers are. And there were 12, there are two major outcomes. Number one, people work for managers. Okay. Number two, mm -hmm. there are 12 questions you can ask to gauge the employee engagement and the likelihood of those employees staying with that organization. So the primary and first place we focus on is the line management relationship that exists. So who are those key employees reporting to now? Who do they see as their key management relationship? So we put a lot of energy into that. So if a key manager is planning to move on, 
we go out of our way to plan that transition. Uh, if they are moving on, that's high risk, okay? Uh, so that's, that's the one area we focus on. Number two, from a culture perspective, we make it very clear right from the beginning that our culture is, our purpose is supporting the dreams of the doers. So the people dynamic of that is that we actually want people to lead a balanced and engaged life. And that means doing great work, being a great father, great mother, in whatever capacity you're, you see as important in your life, you're able to be present and engaged in that. And then on, and from a supporting the dreams of the doer's perspective, on a customer side, it's us taking our technology recommendations or technology knowledge and our knowledge of their business and having an impact on their business uh, goals and objectives. So we're trying to find organizations where that aspiration in our culture resonates. So protect the line management or manager relationship. Number two, what we often find, Pat, in some of these, bus these businesses that we're acquiring, there might be anywhere between three to, to $10 million in revenue. What you often find is they're burning and they're under real pressure and they're struggling with scaling and balancing profitability and those elements. And when we're able to bring the aspirations of our culture forward, it really comes across as a relief to them. And then finally, there's always some people that move on and that's okay. Um, look, the, the first acquisition in New York, uh, we got it so wrong. We, out of about 20 people, we have only one team member left. So that's like a total fail. Uh, fortunately, we kept most of the customers. There were some challenges inherent before we, um, before we did the deal that were part of it, but I hold myself accountable. Um, and so fortunately, touch wood, we managed to get it right uh, the majority of the time, but sometimes you got it wrong and the fit is just not there and people do move on. So is that the situation where in New York, where you ended up with one left on the team, or, and is that the situation where you considered yourself to be too dictatorial? Yes. Okay. And what did yes. that, with the time left, I, I want to take one or two more minutes on, on this, on this topic, but then I want to move to um, your thoughts about what owners should do post exit, because I'm real, real we're, we're very curious about what you think about that. Uh, because that's so much a part of what we do. Uh, but in regard to the, um, the dictatorial piece, what did that look like? How are you being di dictatorial? How would you, for a listener, uh, uh, what can they learn from your experience as to how not to be or how not to be dictatorial? So the, the, the one piece we've learned is each borough, each city, each sort of economic hub has its own dynamics, uh, whether they're cultural nuances and mm -hmm. to, for us to go in and think just because we're a bigger business and, uh, you, you know, and we're perceived to be more successful and ignore those dynamics, um, that, 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 has, that brings a lot of, a lot of failure. Um, so I think there was an arrogance in us thinking that we had all the answers. I remember they used, they well, we actually ended up adopting it, but we had a particular approach to doing customer satisfaction, okay? That drove our New York customers crazy, okay? So what we used to do is we used to find the key contact at our customers every single month and ask them to answer 12 questions based on the American Customer Satisfaction Index. Our quality control department would do an audit of our own tickets, included a customer engagement, and then um, and then so that was the way we did it. We try to. So you it. weren't doing the net promoter score; you were doing <laughs> no. something much more expanded. No, no. So now, 
And then I remember discussing it with the CEO of the business. And he says, no, we use, we use Smileback, which is based on the net promoter score. It's super efficient. New Yorkers don't want to, if they don't want to, they don't want to see us if they don't have to, you know, and if they can do one click, that's great for them. And I remember say, speaking to him, Scott saying, oh no, that's not representative. And now today that's the main thing that we use, but we try to force it and change it. Um, so that's one example. Um, you know, we uh, we use we're we're obsessed with measuring. So we have we use the balance scorecard as a performance measurement system in our business. We we wrote our own version of it about ten years ago. So we measure everything. I've got a balance scorecard. Every single person in the business has got the balance scorecard. So what we did in that uh, particular with that particular um, acquisition slash merger is we forced that too quickly and too hard. It's a massive change management exercise that, you know, if, if you're not used to being really performance measured in detail and right. suddenly you've got some new company in there saying, yeah. we're measuring this, we're measuring that, we're measuring this. So we just did it in a bulldozer way and, and we paid Yeah, so that's price. how you end up, that's, that's how you end up with either one, one lady or one guy standing and that's it. And lose. That's okay. it. No, that's it. And then there were that's other good. examples like that, Pat, where we, 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 you know, in our passion and enthusiasm, we, we broke stuff. Okay. Walter, did you have another, did you have a follow-up question? No, I wanted to, I wanted to hear um, Oren's thoughts on what an owner does after they exit. All right. Okay. So let's do, let's go there. But before we do, rather than me summarizing, let's do it this way, Oren. For listeners who are thinking about acquisition, give them three, just three things. Say, give them a list of three. If you don't do anything else, do these three things. Okay, great. Um, so the first thing would be someone in the leadership team and preferably one of the entrepreneurs and founders of the business needs to say they're going to own this. So what that means is, is creating the time to be able to do it. Okay. So that is critically important. And I will not make it a second point, but I'll add it to this. Make sure you're wrapping your mind around the fact that this is going to cost. You're going to pay, you're going to pay for legal fees. You're going to pay for diligence. You're going to pay a, for a possibly a success fee. Uh, you're going to pay a buy side advisor if you actually really want to find deals. So it's the commitment of a resource, uh, being a, a leader at least, and maybe involving some other team members and the actual investment. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would, I would uh, strongly suggest is go out of your way in the early phases of any engagement uh, with an acquisition opportunity to try and feel the culture fit, the values fit. Is there, is there actually a fit uh, um, from that, uh, on that level? Because if there is, it really just lubricates the engine of, of, of any m and aspiration. And then probably the third would be, I would build a pipeline. Because what can happen when you're, mm -hmm. when you're looking at M&A, and I remember even with us, where we were doing it ad hoc, very small, you fall in love with the opportunity. Look at the numbers. Wow, this is going to be an extra $500,000 EBITDA. And then you come up with the reason to make it work, even when you see 20, 30, 40 warning signs. Whereas if you are, have multiple discussions, you're able to discern and say, well, okay, I can clearly see I like this about that. I don't like that. You know, so those would be my three. It's, it's the investment of resource, both someone's time and capital. It's the culture fit. And then I would try, if you really want to explore this or make it an active part of your growth, I would, I would look to build a, same as sales, build a pipeline. Otherwise, you're just going to fall in love with that one opportunity and you might do the wrong deal for the wrong reason. Yes. So build a pipeline of potential acquisitions. That's what you're referring to there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. 
Excellent. That was fantastic. Okay, now on to the second um, topic, if you will, today. Sure. It, apparently, you've given thought to what you're going to do or what someone should do or think about doing or planning for life after the business. If you if you look at our website, you'll see the tagline says, enjoy life in the business, plan for life after the business. Because yes. we know that... Um, uh, seventy-five percent of owners who exit are miserable within the first year of leaving. And, yes. Um, and so this, uh, we're we're really interested in hearing what you have to say about that. So this is something that I've thought about so so much, and through my involvement in Entrepreneurs Organization, which is over twenty years now, and through my involvement in YPO, which is um, probably 12 years now, I've seen so many friends sell and exit their business. Um, you know, so for me, I've thought a lot about it. And probably if I were to recommend one book that covered the topic the best in my mind, it would be a Bo Burlingham's book, Finish Big. Mm -hmm. I just feel yeah. he really went there and really mm -hmm. uh, um, kind of, uh, covered it in a very extensive way and the particular point you made and you covered it in one of your podcasts where you said the guy did a phenomenal deal I think it was like 40 million dollars or something and but yeah. he was so depressed okay mm -hmm. Bo covers in Finish Big the psychology of what happens so like I've often thought to myself like how big a part of Oren Klopper's identity is nurtured how big a part of my life's purpose is net shirt. And, you know, so what Bo talks about in his book and what I've thought about and what I've seen other entrepreneurs do well is they in detail map out what does next look like? What does that next chapter look like? And the more clarity, I believe, someone can have around that um, from a meaning and a purpose and an engagement perspective the better because typically where it hasn't gone well is there isn't such a clear view there's a sabbatical that comes with some form of depression okay and then uh it's a kind of a clamoring back to how do i get back into this the space i was i was before um so that's that's a really really big one you know we um adam kofi's book um uh, the, the private equity playbook um, and his book, uh, I think it's called the exit strategy playbook. Uh, he's, he's an advisory board member of ours and I've learned so, so, so much from him. You know, so for me, what's next when you exit in my personal goals and aspirations and in what we are advocating to potential uh, entrepreneurs whose businesses we want to buy, we say, let your next chapter be with us. Or if we were to sell him to private equity in two to three years time, I would like them to back us going forward. Mm -hmm. I would like to roll equity so that I can take the power of private equity mm -hmm. and just take mm -hmm. it to the next level. And that is essentially mm -hmm. what we're saying to businesses that, um, that are uh, and entrepreneurs that we're considering acquiring because there are three pillars in my mind for any entrepreneur that is part of your entrepreneurial legacy. Number one, in my opinion, and what often I've seen is their people. Their people are like their work family. They've walked this journey with them. They fought these battles with them. Second is their, their clients, okay? And third is the financial value that they realize out of this, this sale. So I think the greatest opportunity to protect your legacy and to smooth the transition to what's next is be part of another three to five year chapter or another 10 year chapter where you can be sure your people get looked after. You can be sure your customers get looked after and you roll 30% of your equity. So you have another opportunity to have another liquidity event. So that's mm -hmm. really our, our, our thinking. Yeah, that's outstanding. And so you mentioned <coughs> Bo Burlingham's book. We're huge fans of that book. And, actually are starting to just send it out to new to, to new clients we bring on and um, um, 
in regard to the, you mentioned pipeline a few minutes ago, but you were talking about a pipeline of potential acquisitions. Are you at the same time building a pipeline of potential acquirers? Most, most, most definitely. And um, it's, it's a function of where we might go and the, 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 the options we might have but it's also a function of, of learning and growth. So I've got some private equity firms that I've got a very good relationship with, and they know we don't want to do anything right now, but um, I think they have a visibility that and an experience base that is just unbelievably valuable to me. So, I mean, we're, we were looking at, um, we're looking at a certain type of technology for the for an acquisition right now, and uh, I bounced it off this uh, this one particular partner at a private equity firm that I'm close to. So in that way, we're nurturing the relationship, but it's not just about the end potential end goal. We're actually learning from each other. So I share openly with them; they share openly with us, uh, and I think that is that's very healthy. And where what you can also do in that time is you can see if there's a fit. Because as in, we need to find the right fit for businesses we're acquiring. In turn, if we were to do a transaction down the line and we believe that another three, five, 10 year uh, journey is part of that, we need to make sure the fit is right. So nurturing those relationships in the lead up to that point, you know, nothing, nothing defines the success of a relationship or tests a relationship better than time and make the most of that time. That's our thinking. Yeah, and again, that would be getting to know primarily, probably, their um, values, their core values, and their culture. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Now you've mentioned you mentioned a couple of times private equity as a potential uh, yes. acquirer or a pipeline of uh, private equity buyers. What about strategic buyers? Is that a, a, is a, you have any strategic buyers on your pipeline of potential acquirers of your business? Uh, yes uh, yes for sure okay uh -huh. for sure and i think there's a similar learning opportunity there as well um and also collaboration uh, opportunities with a strategic buyer um where you might not be represented in certain geographies or there's certain skills that they have that you don't so we've definitely we nurture some of those some of those relationships uh, as well mm-hmm Good. Walter, did you, I think you had a question. Did you have something and I just kind of spoke up? No, no, not at all. Okay, good. All right, good. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, this last piece here is, it, we consider it to be absolutely essential to a successful exit, uh, is to plan what's next and how you're going to make that happen. Because too often owners, I don't know that they even realize it as it's happening a lot of time, the impact, the significant impact they're having on so many different people. You know, of course, their employees and their uh, customers or clients, the local economy, the chair, most are charitable. And so there's all this significance and meaning to life and purpose, if you will, that they're experiencing as a business owner uh, sometimes for decades, maybe even if it's for a couple of years. And then when it's gone, they, they look forward to thinking, oh, I can't wait to get out of here, can't wait. But then when, when yeah. all of that purpose and meaning is gone, you mentioned depression. Well, the depression and other things like that can just um, get a foothold if you haven't done this planning well beforehand. Um, and uh, so really appreciate uh, your thoughts on that. Any other thing that, anything else that you would say, uh, you know what, let's do the same thing. Is there three things that you would recommend with this piece, the way you did with the first piece? Most definitely. And I thought about this when I was listening to some of your podcasts and um, you know, the, what what we sometimes as entrepreneurs do, which is natural, is we have this belief that what we have built is totally uh, it's 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 so unusual 
that the normal economic forces of any market don't apply to us. You know, so, so the first thing I would do is if you're seriously considering selling your business, is go out of your way to understand what are realistic valuations in your space. I've had too many discussions and now, I, now mm -hmm. I'd address it very early on. We got on so well and we just had the most amazing conversations. And then you get to discussions around numbers and they're expecting a 15 times multiple and they've removed their salaries and the other shareholders salary. And it's just right. like, it's dead in the water. So right. I would get it. I would get a realistic grasp uh -huh. of what a valuation, what a valuation looks like. And then secondly, I would, I would do a, sort of a five, 10 year view of, of, of what your life goals and passions and dreams are and what that could look like post mm -hmm. an initial liquidity event. You know, so maybe the first five years you're an executive, then the next five years you're an advisor and there's some type of capacity and then you could potentially even try and plant those seeds and negotiate that, uh, that upfront. And then lastly, and I also thought about this when I was listening to your podcast, we're talking to a particular opportunity right now where I'm just so impressed with this leader. He basically made the decision a year and a half ago that he was going to exit. Okay. He put his management team around the table, spoke to them about it. Okay. And has involved them in the process. They're not, from what I understand, they're not shareholders. And even in the process where we're meeting with them now, which is quite unusual because we haven't even signed an LOI, um, we're meeting with his management team. So, you know, the transition here, if we did this deal, is just going to be next level because these guys have had a year and a half to digest this, wrap their mind around it. They've been involved in it. And for me as an acquirer, this is exactly how we run our business. And to see a, a smaller business that has such an elevated level of leadership. So maybe just to conclude, the one thing is get a realistic view of valuation because you can waste a lot of your time if you don't. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And num number two, um, have a very, very, I would, I would tell your team, tell your team very, very clearly that this is what you're planning to do. And it's not, you're going to do it tomorrow. It's going to happen some point in the future. And then um, uh, thirdly, it comes down to really being able to, um, uh, uh, I forgot my third point. It was in the, in the middle, in the well, second. I, I might better tell you what it was. You, you tell me if this is right. Did I hear right? It, it sounded like you were saying, get consider getting your management team involved with the actual plan for exit. Yes. Yeah. So now I remember it now. So the three, the one is understand valuations, get your management team uh, involved in understanding the exit. And then the third one is try and map out the next five, 10 years oh, of your uh, life yeah, five, so that you've years, got a right. clear view of what that can look like. Mm -hmm. Right. Got it. Okay, excellent. So the first uh, topic that we talked about today was just acquisitions, the good, bad, and the ugly, what, what Oren has learned, and uh, his three uh, exhortations there, if you will, or, or recommendations would be identify someone on your team to lead the project, if you will. Uh, so put forth human capital as well as uh, it, it, to lead the project but also recognize it's going to cost some cash <laughs> uh, to make it happen. So resources, human capital and financial capital, uh, then make sure, oh, and we preach this all the time. If you're going to, if you're going to acquire a business, just do everything you can to make sure that the values and the culture align. There's alignment mm -hmm. there. That would be number two. And then build and then start today building a pipeline of potential acquisitions that you can start to get to know over time and see if indeed those, the, those uh, cultures align and you have the same vision and, and so on and so forth. So that, that was part one of the discussion. And in part two here in the last piece was, how do you plan for a successful life after the business? And the three, the three recommendations there were something you've heard, if you've ever listened to this podcast before, you've heard us talk about the importance of getting a realistic objective valuation of your business, that'd be number one. That's going to help you with all your financial goals. So it's going to help you 
to, to um, figure out if you have a financial gap between what you have and what you're going to need. And in, in meaningful planning requires accurate data. And that's what we would say about that number one recommendation. And then number two is uh, start now to think about five to 10 years after you actually exit and what life is going to look like. Where is that purpose and meaning and significance going to come from? And number three, and tell me again, if I get this wrong or right, Orin, is to involve your management team and starting to help you think through your potential exit. Did I get the third one right? Perfect. Okay. All right, good. So Walter, I think you, you're you going to wrap us up here and, and okay. maybe you have a, a last question. I don't know. Okay. Oren, thanks for joining us. This has been uh, really, really informative. I feel like we're kind of getting... We got information from the front lines, you know, real, real, real world stuff. So it was, uh, Thank I'm you. sure our listeners enjoyed it. I know I did, and I'm, I'm sure Pat did too. Um, mm -hmm. Two quick questions for you. Is there anything you'd like to promote? And how can listeners contact you? I'll definitely, look, I love sales and I love leads. So I will not say no to that opportunity. So our, our most exciting offering that we have is called Innovate. It's a managed service where if you're, if you're a business and you have between 25 to 1,000 people and you use Microsoft as your primary technology, leveraging Office 365 specifically, and hypothetically, we charge you $5,000 a month and that accrues to $12,000, I mean, $60,000 in a 12-month period, uh, we will find you $60,000 worth of ROI based on automation, uh, productivity, training, license cost reduction. So this is our Innovate offering. And we actually do a, 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 um, a no-charge engagement where we will meet with you and come up with a list of what we think those potential initial opportunities are as a way for you to fill it out. And uh, the best way to get hold of me is, um, I'm not sure if you'll publish it with a podcast, but is on by email, orin, uh, O-R-R-I-N, at netsurit.com. Or you can get me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm super, super responsive. So it's Oren Klopper. Um, those are probably the two easiest ways to, to get hold of me. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity for, um, for, for listeners. So again, thanks so much for joining us. We really, really enjoyed it. Yes. Walter, Thank Pat, you. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Thank you. And listeners, if you want help in building a transferable business, or planning for your exit, you can uh, reach out at grfcpa.com or exitreadiness.com. Also, if you set up a free account at exitreadiness.com, you'll receive a 10% discount on any products purchased if you use the code podcast. Until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off. <laughs>